Blake, thank you for sharing your journey with us and reminding us that the simple moments are easy to miss. But if we are aware, we may spark moments of happiness. Thank you, Shannon and Andrew. This message, this was put on one of the boards. This is one of about 22,000 messages that people have left for me, complete strangers, over the last 477 days I've done this therapy. Um, but this has been my therapy. <laughs> I just go out and I meet complete strangers. Um, and some of you I might have met already, but probably most of you are strangers. Um, <laughs> so let me go back. And then actually I give everybody Sharpie markers too. That's been an integral part of what I do every day. Um, but let me go back and share with you how all this started. And I'll start with the trauma that I went through. Um, one night in downtown Phoenix where I live, um, on the seventh floor loft, I was asleep that night, I was sick, and three guys came into my home, and I was held down and sexually assaulted that night. Uh, and it was horrific for me. I shut down after the police left, and for a long time, I, I became more and more suicidal as time went on. And then things came to a head on one night, it was early November of 2015, and on that night, my TV was on. And on that night, the late show with Stephen Colbert was on, and I laughed. And it was a big moment for me. I paused the TV and I sat there for a while, and I finally said to myself, I'm getting on this show. <laughs> I'm gonna be a guest on this show. And I went to bed that night with hope. It was the first time in a long time I had hope. And the next morning I woke up, I went to a staple store in Central Phoenix, and I had to get something for, <laughs> it was something totally unrelated to this, but I happened to walk past these giant foam poster boards and this lady came up to me and said, can I help you? And I said, do you have more of these in the back? And she said, let me go check, how many do you want? And that was my light bulb moment. I just sat there and I said, I'll take all of them. And I decided I would get a ton of Sharpie markers, I would buy all these boards, and <laughs> the idea I had was I would just start going out and meeting strangers every day, uh, full time. I figured maybe up to six to eight hours a day. I would share my story of my trauma with them. I would um, ask them if they'd sign support on these giant boards and then hopefully get behind my efforts to get on the Late Show as a guest. And then I have this Dr. Zeus mentality that I'm gonna get on the Late Show and I'm gonna tell my story of what happened to me and turn it into something happy. That sounds Dr. Zeus to me. Um, <laughs> so that's how this whole thing started and on November 12th of 2015 I set out and I started meeting strangers and today's the 477th day in a row I do this and I've now met yeah under 22,000 people and I'm not suicidal so I'm here. <laughs> um, thanks. And for me I always tell people it's so much more than the late show because for me it's about what it represented that night. It was something close to me. It was laughter. And that's why it was so profound for me that night when I sat there and I paused the TV show because I kept looking for what I told everybody was the miracle in the distance to save me from severe PTSD. And it wasn't. It was laughter. And it was really emotional that night for me. But it could have been a food. It could have been a pet, a spouse. It was laughter that night. And <laughs> more importantly too, is I thought like an eight-year-old kid that night. I used no frontal cortex whatsoever because if I would have, I would have talked myself out of this because I know I'm not a celebrity and there's no reason I should get on a show like that. But it was the mindset of an eight-year-old kid and just sheer hope and I ran with that. And for a few months I was doing this and then finally one of the doctors that works with me, she said, why don't you go back to your psychiatrist and see if he has suggestions. He didn't know I was doing this. So she said, maybe you could show this to him. So I was super excited. I felt like, I felt like an eight-year-old kid. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be like show and tell. I can show this psychiatrist what I've been doing. And I get in there and the psychiatrist looks at all this and says, you wanna get on the late show? Yes. He said, you do know that people like you and I, we don't get on shows like this. And I said, no, I don't know that. And he said, well, you don't. <laughs> and I said, I disagree. And so it went sideways from there. Um, <laughs> he, wanted to, he wanted to diagnose me with more illnesses as though I needed anything more to deal with. And then he wanted, <laughs> he wanted to medicate me. And I laugh at that because of the absurdity of it. I mean, you guys, think about this. If we would have medicated Steve Jobs 20 years ago, 
because of his ideas, because something is so vastly different than what you, you normally see, you don't shut it down. So needless to say, I left his office and I never went back. Um, and I kept doing this. All I wish is if the doctor would have taken the time to find out what this was doing for me, I had a purpose. Every day I'd get up and I was disciplined. I knew that I was gonna, for six to eight hours, I was gonna go and meet total strangers somewhere. And then for two or three hours, I'd update everybody on social media what I was doing. Um, I had to pack a backpack every day. That sounds minor, but for somebody with PTSD, this is give, giving me something to do every day. Um, and then I'm walking. Some days I was walking 20 to 25,000 steps a day. That's a lot. I don't know how many miles. <laughs> Some days I walked a lot, 10 hours a day. So it gave me that per. And a lot of people with PTSD, they stay in their homes. You don't get out, so you're getting no exercise. I was doing all that. And then I'm very vulnerable because every day I'm going out. Think about this. I'm talking and telling my story to people every day. They're hearing this. So I'm connecting with them. They're connecting with me, and I'm finding out what, what issues that they're dealing with, and I don't feel alone. And then the other thing is I started controlling this story every single day. This story used to control me every day, and it flipped. Um, but he didn't take the time to learn that, too, and I wish he would have. Um, the other thing, too, is that I had fear. I have fear every day. <laughs> like I'm standing in front of you guys. I don't know you guys, a lot of you. So, I mean, it's just fear of the unknown. But mistakenly, a lot of people think, oh, Blake goes out and he meets people. You have to be the most fearless guy. No. Every day I walk up to somebody, there's a moment of fear. But it's so cool to look at these boards I have because each one of those messages is a moment of fear that I overcame. And that's where I get stronger and stronger every single day. It's actually a moment of fear you guys all overcame that signed him because you don't know me either. Like, who is this guy? Why is he approaching me? Um, but I, there was this cool moment I met these people in the improv theater, and they told me one of the main tenets of improv, improv is follow the fear. And this guy, he wrote on there, follow the fear on one of the boards, it was really cool. Um, but when he, he said this to me, he said, in improv, when you follow the fear, boom, on the other side of that is where all the magic happens. And that's the same thing on my journey every day is that I go up to you guys, the strangers, and I follow that fear, and boom, that's where all the magic happens. That's where I get better from this therapy. And if I can stay on that, just sort of that theme of magic, um, the Sharpie markers, <laughs> they're the most amazing thing. It's like, I've always said it's the most magical thing to take, a, after I tell my story to people I come up to, to watch a group of adults, I say, okay, I told my story, here's the board, you can put anything you want on it, and drop 24 Sharpies down there. It's incredibly magic. People transform into an eight-year-old kid. Um, and it's really cool because if you think about it, I said earlier, this whole journey for me, this therapy started, I had a mindset of an eight-year-old. And then I share back with these people with Sharpies, and they come at me as an eight-year-old kid. It's unbelievable. And people, they've signed these things in 83 languages now. They put poetry. They put artwork. They put jokes. They put Bible verses. They put whatever they want, and it's just it creates this, it's just this huge creative aspect that comes out. And then I get to go home every day and I read these. And for the rest of my life, if I have a moment where I'm down and I have a trigger, I'm going to read these. It stays with me. Um, and then I want to tell you guys this one moment. It probably captures the true essence of this whole journey for me, this therapy. I was in a coffee shop, I'm always in coffee shops. If some of you guys have met me before, you know I go to coffee shops everywhere around the six states I've been in. But these four people I went up to, and there were three of them in their 30s, and one of them was about 70 years old. And the three in their 30s, they signed really quickly. And then the guy, about 70 years old, he, he took off his glasses, he crossed his arms like this, and he just stared right at me. And <laughs> I told myself, here we go. Um, and I, the reason I say that, the, there's a demographic that responds like super favorably to, toward me, and that's the millennials. They love it. They sign really quickly. I'm sort of like Bernie Sanders with the <laughs> millennials. They love me. <laughs> so, um, but the 70 year old, and the reason I think too that um, as people get older though, I think they've had a lot more experiences, bad experiences in life than the younger generation, so they tend to be more skeptical. They tend to be a little more jaded. 
Um, so anyway, he goes into the Q&A with me, the 70-year-old, and he says, you want to get on this show? Yes. But you're not a celebrity. Nope. You haven't been on the national news for anything big lately. Nope. You don't have any major like, talent. And I'm assuming he means like juggling chainsaws or something like that. No, I have nothing. And I just cut him off finally and said, you know what? I, I may never get on the late show. And he looks at me and says, then why are you doing this? And I sat really quietly for a while. And there's this movie moment. If you guys ever saw the movie Hook from 26 years ago, Robin Williams plays Peter Pan. And in this movie, he's Peter Pan. He lives in London. He's got a wife, a couple of kids. He's a lawyer, but he's older. He forgets he's Peter Pan. But his two kids are taken one night. And then he's transported back to Neverland, and he's so confused. Well, Julia Roberts plays Tinkerbell, and it's her job to get all the Lost Boys to make him remember he's Peter Pan. He's got to save his kids from Hook. So there's a five-minute frenetic scene. It's really fun. It's crazy. And they're trying to get Robin Williams to remember all these Lost Boys. And all of a sudden, it all comes to a stop. And the only two people moving are Robin Williams and this littlest Lost Boy, and the camera comes in for a close-up, and the little boy, little lost boy, takes off the glasses from Robin, starts rearranging his face with his hands, and after 30 seconds of doing this, he finally looks into the eyes of Robin Williams, and he says, oh, there you are, Peter. And at that moment, you know all the lost boys now know this is Peter Pan, but more importantly, Robin Williams now knows he is Peter Pan. He realizes he's an eight-year-old kid. And he knows he's going to save these kids of his because he's found hope. And I go back to the coffee shop with this guy. And he, I tell him, I may never get on the show. And he says, why are you doing this? And I wanted to look into his eyes and just... Say, oh, there you are, Peter. I wanted to let him know there's still an eight-year-old kid in him, and there still is hope. And I go back to my moment in early November of 2015. I'm, I'm by myself. It's cold, it's dark, and I'm suicidal. And the TV's on. And the late show's playing. And I laugh, and I pause the show, and I sit there just quietly. And I sat there for a few minutes, and I just finally looked deep inside myself, and I said, oh, there you are, Peter. And I, I found my eight-year-old kid inside me. And I knew I was going to be okay because I had found hope. Thank you, guys.